Okay, so we've gone through unsupervised classification. Um, we're now going to go through supervised classification. So supervised classification, it requires some supervision, right? You need to be specifying um, to the whatever algorithm you use um, a numerical description of various land cover types present in a, a given scene. So that means you first have to determine what classes you're going to need to use, and then you're going to need to collect information and in the form of training samples that you can use to define the spectral characteristics of each one of those classes. So there are three main stages. The first is creating the classification scheme and collecting the training data. That's the training stage. Um, doing the classification itself, which uh, takes the spectral information that you've collected and applies that to actually classify the individual pixels. And then accuracy assessment, which we will talk about next, but um, I stress it over and over again, because again, without an accuracy assessment, a formal accuracy assessment, you really are on um, not very solid ground in using the output of a classification. So in the training stage, operator, you are going to identify representative training areas with a scene, okay, and develop a numerical description of the spectral attributes of each of the land cover types you're interested in. And again, you need to define which ones you're interested in. And that's going to be totally de dependent on what your objective is. Um, ultimately, the accuracy you're going to get is determined during this training stage. Okay. And that's what's going to determine the success or failure. And as I mentioned before, um, just the mechanics of collecting the training data sets. Um, that brings in the potential for human error. So for instance, you know, you're going to be digitizing polygons around areas that you think are um, a particular cover type and that have a particular um, uniform spectral quality. Um, but you will undoubtedly, in some cases, screw that up. And you will, you know, for instance, digitize over a road. So now you have an example of, say, a forest class, but it's, say, it's got a concrete road, but it's much brighter, therefore, than, um, than other forests. And so you've made the forest class highly variable by adding in that particular training site. So those are the kind of human error um situations that lead to bad supervised classifications and in general you'll probably in in the lab do a bad supervised classification because it's your first time first time i did a supervised classification it came out badly um it's just there are too many things to juggle all at the same time to really be able to do it well the first time uh, we have this concept that in order to get acceptable results, your training data has to be representative and complete. Um, and by uh, representative and complete, they, they seem in some ways like contrary. Um, goals. So representative means you should have examples of, um, of say, forests that are representative of what most forests look like in the, um, in the scene. So for instance, when you're, when you're creating training data sets, you don't want to have every kind of forest. So for instance, you might not want to have, you know, forests that have beetle kill in them because 
that's not a typical forest. And we're going to be creating these statistical um, descriptions of what a forest looks like spectrally. And if we start throwing in a lot of examples of um, a lot of examples of unusual types of forest, we're going to wind up with a class that basically could look like anything in the image. Um, but there is also a need for completeness. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, if you're dealing with crops and you, um, have corn and soybean and oats in the image, then you better include soil, oats, and uh, corn as separate classes, or at least spectral subclasses of, um, of a crop type, an overall crop type. So it's a balancing act is what I'm trying to get at. Um, so, um, Again, you know, there are, there are a number of approaches to collecting, you know, training data to give you spectral signatures, but they all rely to a certain degree on the experience of the analyst. And so, um, you know, very often I'll be looking over the shoulder of someone doing a supervised classification and we'll see that particular areas are being, um, uh, misclassified and will focus in on those areas that appear to be having having some problems with classification sometimes you have to put in pairs of points one of them say in a forest that looks like um, a, a shrub area um, and in a shrub area that looks like forest so that you can define where that boundary is. Again, it all comes down to having experience with this kind of, of analysis. This is what a training uh, uh, data set looks like. So this is for Morrow Bay in California. And what they've done is they have put down um, a series of polygons. Fundamentally, that's what training data sites are, you know. You're putting in polygons around areas that you've, you're certain, um, either because you've been there or because you are looking at other data like photo data that tells you that that's a particular class and uh, giving a, a label to that particular area so that the computer can then go in and calculate average spectral qualities for each one of the, the classes. So that's what uh, will be, as far as the computer is concerned, the output of the training data um, uh, stage. Um, a series of average, and it's not shown here, but also standard deviations of the um, either digital numbers or reflectances in your image as a function of band and as a function of your differing land cover types. So in this case, we have a, a series of uh, water and sediment types, all of which are relatively dark. And then it's hard to see, but there's one class there, surf, which is much brighter than any of the other classes. And so you would imagine that it'd be easy to separate out um, the surf areas from any of these other areas. Um, much easier than it would be to separate out, say, one of the sediment values or sediment classes. So now we're looking back in feature space, um, and this is um, this is a data set that I made from um, again National Land Cover data set and an image I had. So I used the National Land Cover data set to uh, generate training data to use uh, within, this is ERDOS, similar visualization exists within ArcGIS, and it's showing you 
all of the classes that we're interested in there. There's 13 that we've got um, that we found within the scene of interest and where they lay out and how they overlap. Note, these are um, quarter uh, uh, standard deviation ellipses. So we're looking at just where the very core pixels are. And you can see that they line up well with that grayscale um, two-dimensional histogram in the background. Um, you know, generally we have um, ellipses in all the places where there are a lot of points. Um, if we had used an unsupervised classification, then we would have a perfect relationship between the places where the ellipses are and where the most points are. But this is one of the things that you get into with, unsuper uh, with supervised classification is that your defined classes may not align um, perfectly with um, the actual uh, spectral classes in the image itself. So here's just an example of a supervised and unsupervised comparison. This is for, gosh, I don't remember, but it's obviously an area that's got um, some, uh, it's a desert scene and it's got some darker geology and then it looks like it's got some saline crust as well. So this is probably from, from Yuma, Arizona, which is a place where I've worked. Um, oh. oh, sorry. Um, we had the input data image and the, um, and the polygons for supervised and then for unsupervised, of course, we just have the image. Here's the supervised, um, and if you think back to the original image um, or go back in time, then you can see that it does a pretty good job of picking up the various classes. Um, unsupervised, we used enough uh, classes that actually it's picking up um, some nice variability within each one of the classes, um, but with some recoding, it would probably look a lot more like the supervised classification. Um, and that's, of course, very often merging uh, classes uh, is part of that unsupervised classification approach. So advantages and disadvantages of supervised classification. Um, advantages, the analyst controls the selected menu of information classes or categories, and they can tailor them for a specific purpose and geographic region. Um, you've tied your classes to specific areas of known identity rather than just statistical properties in the image as a whole. And you can evaluate results um, with additional training areas as you go along. The disadvantages are the analyst is imposing a classification structure on the data, and it, it may not match the natural spectral clusters that exist. The training data is defined based on information categories and not on spectral properties. So for instance, there might be important variations in forests that you're not picking up using the classification scheme. Um, careful selection of training areas is time and labor intensive which is why in the lab, we don't aim on having a, a really good supervised classification for a, a large number of classes. We simplify it quite a bit. Um, and training areas may not encompass and or represent special or unique categories that don't fit into the information classes that you've generated um, in your head. So, and we saw that actually when we looked at the, the overlapping ellipses from the Erdos um, um, figures where I had looked at the various classes from the NLCD. The NLCD classes did not line up very well with the, where most of the points were in, 
in some places. Um, and then to review unsupervised classification advantages, no extensive prior knowledge of the region is required. The opportunity for those little digitization errors and similar things is minimized. Unique classes will be recognized as distinct units. And logistically, it's just less cumbersome to have to deal with or to not have to deal with the training data data sets. The disadvantages, natural groupings are, do not necessarily correspond nicely with your information classes. You have no control over the menu of classes and what their identification would be. Um, and the spectral properties of information classes vary over time and between scenes. And so it's, it's difficult to impossible to reuse the results of an unsupervised classification. It's something that has to be done new for each new image. Whereas you do have some ability to take a supervised classification and uh, train it from one image and then apply it to another image. Okay, so now we're down to pixel classification. This is something we've sort of um, um, ignored during our discussion. But once you have cluster means, whether it's been generated from unsupervised classification or supervised classification, you need to, you know, you have the cluster means which is the same as saying you have the spectral signatures, you need to have rules that allow you to take individual pixels and say, well, which class does a particular pixel um, look like? Um, and there are various ways you can, you can mathematize the question of what things look like, what's most similar. Uh, we'll talk about four actually. One of them is the minimum distance to mean. The next one is a parallel piped classifier. Um, we'll look at the maximum likelihood classifier, which until recently has been the most popular. And then we'll look at the tr decision tree analysis. So um, this is what we would have at the end of an unsupervised classification, right? Each one of those letters represents a Num, um, a particular class and its location represents what its brightness or reflectance is in two bands, band four and band three. So each one of those um, was generated by digitizing a, a small error area on the image and calling it one of those classes and then average uh, spectral values were calculated for each one and the little value, you know, the class code um, was plotted at the position implied by the mean spectral values. So the simplest way you can make rules about, or the simplest rule you can have about classifying a new point, and we've got two new points there. Uh, you, should, you should say point one and point two. Um, is to simply define the maximum and minimum spectral values in each wavelength band, right? So it's easy to see here because we have a two wavelength plot. You can use um, minimum or maximum values uh, of the training data for that class to come up with that. Um, or you could use standard deviations. Uh, it's not commonly done, but it can be done. So plot, the mean plus or minus either one, two, or three standard deviations. Um, this is a non-parametric rule, meaning that it's not based on uh, statistics, and therefore it's, um, um, if you use min-max values, I should say, it's independent of the statistical properties of the data, okay? Um, the advantage is it's simple and it's fast, right? All you're doing is saying, okay, we're going to define everything within a particular box as urban or sand or hay or forest. Um, and if, like with point one, uh, oh, sorry, with point two, it falls within the box of urban, um, then that's what it is. It's urban. 
Um, if it falls within the box of, of hay, then as, as with point one, then we're gonna define it as hay. So it's simple, it's fast, it's often useful for a, a first pass broad classification just to see how you're doing. Uh, the disadvantages are it's not very accurate. Um, so um, if you look particularly at point one, okay, it falls within the range of um, spectral qualities for um, hay, H, um, but it's not really very much like hay. It's near, um, you know, the minimum value for band four, but the maximum value for band three. And so there's really no hay in that area uh, that we've we've defined. Therefore, uh, it's it's probably not hay. It's going to be an incorrect classification. It's much closer to looking like a, a C or corn, right? Even though it doesn't fall within those limits. You can also see that in some cases, these boxes overlap. So there's areas where corn and hay overlap. There's areas where hay and forest overlap. And so making a decision about what class you should be assigned to is problematic. There's really no um, good, um, there's no good way to do it. Um, generally, it's, it's just randomly assigned one or the other class. There are also areas where there's no definition. These like large areas that have no box around them. And in that case, you have a, a pixel whose class is undefined. And since your whole goal was to define all the classes um, or define the class of every pixel, this is a problem, you have undefined pixels. Honestly, parallel pipette, nobody uses anymore, but uh, it's the simplest approach. So I talk about it to sort of have an intro to more complex approaches. Next most uh, uh, complex approach um, is minimum distance to means. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna define for each class uh, a mean point. So the centroid or center of mass of each one of those classes. And you can see in this particular um, image that a little uh, uh, plus sign has been put near the center of each class. So that's the, the mean urban condition or the mean or condition or spectral uh, condition, um, the mean sand uh, position or spectral condition, et cetera, et cetera. And then if we have new pixels, like again, one and two, all we do is say, well, um, you know, what is the the class that has the most similar mean to that new pixel. So one is closest to the center pixel for corn. So that would be assigned corn. Two is closest to sand. Um, and therefore it would be assigned to sand. So um, you use the Euclidean distance, right? To determine the distance of each unknown pixel to each class mean. There are other distances. You should have studied this in GIS. You can use a city block distance or straight line method. Um, but in general, it's the Euclidean distance that we use. It's a parametric decision rule because it's based on the statistical parameters um, of all the pixels that are in a training data sample. The advantages are that it's fast because it's mathematically simple, computationally efficient, it's reasonably accurate. All the pixels are assigned to a class. Um, even if you're in the middle of nowhere, there's some class that you're closest to. Although some algorithms allow you to say, if you're further than a particular distance away from the closest class mean, then don't provide a classification for that particular pixel. Um, the disadvantages are, that A, um, it's not sensitive to different amounts of variance in the training data sets. So if we look at point two, right? Point two is closest to 
the center point for so uh, for sand but it actually falls in an area where you've got urban pixels so we have things that are very similar to um, to point two that have been declared you know using our knowledge of the field or using photos to be urban and so even though it's closer to uh, sand it's more likely to be urban and that's the reason we come up with that conclusion is we haven't looked at the variability uh, within the two classes sand points seem to very tightly cluster around um, that mean uh, position whereas urban points and this is largely the case with real urban areas they're a mix of different kinds of surfaces so they tend to be highly variable so there's a lot of variability in the urban class and that is what makes point two more similar to urban because that urban stretches out a long ways from the center point um, so if you have an application where spectral classes are close to each other and the classes have some high variance or you have classes with both low and high variance then you're going to wind up uh, not wanting to use minimum distance the classifier that people have used for a very long time is the maximum likelihood classifier and the maximum likelihood classifier creates probability um, uh, density functions so basically bell curves right like i've shown here for class one and class two and that's what you use to determine the probability of an unknown pixel belonging to a particular training class so you can imagine that you have a pixel um, with a, a spectral value um, anywhere along that line um, that horizontal line where you have class one and class two um, if those points are or that if that point is below one of the peaks of the two curves if it's under the peak for class one then it's highly likely that it belongs to class one if it's in the portion of that curve that doesn't overlap with class two it's also highly probable that it belongs to class one um, where you get into a question is when you have a point that falls where the two curves overlap and so that means that there are spectral conditions um, where either class one or class two could um, be potential classes um, and so what you do is you look at the um which um which class has the higher probability as illustrated by having the higher value on the the red line that defines the probability okay so um the only place where you can't define that is where the two red lines intersect and then you have equal probability for either um, class and in that case um, which is relatively infrequent you have a random assignment of the pixel to either class one or class two um, we'll see what a, a ellipsoidal equal probability contour looks like i think in the next slide um, so here we have the same classes again and what you can imagine is that each one of those classes has associated with it a, a, a three-dimensional shape okay and that three-dimensional shape projected into the two-dimensional shape gives it the the equal probability line so if you're near the center of say the urban um, class that first equal probability or center most equal probability line shows that there's a you know a 90 percent chance that you belong to that class and then as you go further out 
the probability that you belong to that class is less and less. And you can see that, you know, for instance, with urban and sand, the lines um, um, on the, the equal probability lines touch, okay? So that's in the, the three-dimensional sense where the, the two probability um, bell shapes um, intersect. Another way to look at this is like this, okay? So here we have the shapes for um, the probability. The higher up you are, the higher the probability that you belong to one of these classes. So you can see sand has the highest probability. That's because all the probability is in, in one small area, okay? And so if you're in that small area, then you definitely belong to sand. Urban, on the other hand, you can see is a lower feature. Um, and at some point, the urban feature and the sand feature um, interact. And that's where you have to have make a, a rule about deciding whether or not you're urban or sand. The advantages of this approach, it's the most robust, bleh, most robust of the three we've looked at. It gives you the most accurate results. I mean, provided the training data is good, but that's always a question. Um, and it takes the variability of classes into account by using the covariance matrix, um, how variable each one of the classes is in each one of the bands. The disadvantage is it tends to overclassify signatures or, or classes with relatively large values in the covariance matrix. Basically, highly variable classes tend to sort of swamp all the other classes. So urban, for instance, um, is a class where, in this case, it was very nicely defined. But because urban is um, a highly variable class by nature, if you sample it very well and take into account every possible kind of thing that you might call urban, then there's going to be a, a pretty good probability that almost anything in the image could belong to the urban class. Um, and maximum likelihood makes that possible. Okay, um, the one other um, approach to classification rules I wanna talk about is uh, the, sorry, it's a long lecture, um, is the um, partition method or uh, forest method. So decision tree classification um, has become very a very important uh, approach in uh, quantitative analysis. Um, it's a it's a classification algorithm that uses the training data to develop a, a tree-like set of classification rules or decisions. Okay, and they've gained tremendous popularity for classifying remote sensing data due to the fact they're non-parametric. They don't require any statistical assumptions about, say, the normality of the dis underlying distribution of the spectral values. And they're very easy to use and, and interpret. So um, two statistical problems um, that you run into with data analysis in general is um, they're on top, the top left, most statistical um, um, approaches assume fundamentally that the data is drawn from a normal distribution, okay? Uh, you can see that when we were looking at the maximum likelihood approach. You know, you're assuming that under, fundamentally, the data was drawn normally and has this nice bell-shaped curve. Well, we already saw when we looked at uh, univariate and uh, multivariate statistical approaches in remote sensing that that's hardly ever the case. 
I mean, that's definitely the exception. Usually you have multimodal data. That is, you have different cover types that have different mean values for a particular band. And so you have clumps or modes um, of values for each one of those classes. Um, so that's the, the two conditions on the top. On the bottom, um, um, most statistical approaches assume homoscedacity. Shoot, homoscedasticity. I always screw that up. Um, meaning that the variability in one variable is the same relative to another variable. You can see how that is. As you go from small values to large values on the x-axis, the variability on the y-axis remains similar. However, most data sets have heteroscedasticity. Okay, that is as values get larger, the more variable they become. And so you start out making these two assumptions about your data set that are are um, probably not correct. And although you can fix this by using data transformations, the truth of the matter is, particularly in something like remote sensing, where you have lots of bands and you have lots of possible combinations of bands, it's very difficult to go in and, and properly assess for these conditions and correct for them um, for any reasonable data set. So decision tree classifies uh, classifiers develop classification of rules by recursively partitioning the training data into homogeneous groups. So here we have three groups, red, green, and blue. Um, blue is water. Um, um, red is forest and green is soil. Okay and we're plotting them in a feature space, band four versus band two. And the first thing that a, uh, class, a tree classifier is gonna do is it's gonna look for um, a, a simple rule that is going to separate out one or more of the classes from each other. And it can immediately find one. This first classification rule simply says, if band two is less than 0.1, then those are water pixels. Um, easy enough. And you can see that that classification rule then enters in at the top of our classification tree. So here we have a question, is band two less than uh, 0.1? Um, if it is, then it's water. If it's not, then it goes to the rest of the data. This is all within the upper left-hand uh, graph. So now all we have left to look at are forest points and soil points. And again, we need a rule. And again, we have a simple rule here. We can say, if band four is greater than 0.3, then it's a forest. If band four is less than 0.3, it's a soil. Okay, and going back to the upper left hand figure again, under the rest of the data, we have our rule there, band four greater than 0.3. And then if it's yes, it's a forest. If it's no, then it's a soil. Okay, and those final determinations are in the in the tree structure known as terminal nodes so that's where your classification comes out and the advantage about this is that we're not really looking at um we're not really looking at the the variability in a particular class um per se but that variability is still going to be incorporated in where the thresholds are put for each individual rule. So you start with an image, you just take the individual bands 
and generate a training data um, or, or take the, the training data and the rules that were generated, follow the rules for each one um, uh, to get at each one of the final nodes. So you wind up with an area of water, an area of forest, and an area of, of soil. Um, straightforward. Okay, finally, uh, I'm going to get to uh, garbage in, garbage out, which is an expression you may be familiar with, um, or developing training sets for supervised classification. So these are sort of the rules of thumb that you need to be thinking about when you think about doing um, supervised classification. Like I said, a lot of your success uh, with doing supervised classification is just going to be based on how much experience you have. And so this few slides are just there to try to give you some of that background that, that I've picked up. So we talked about this before. What's a, a representative sample of, um, of a particular land cover class? We're going to be generating these training data sets. Each uh, uh, individual piece of training data is going to be a polygon with a label. Do you want those polygons to be spectrally pure? That is, do you want to look for areas that um, have no variability in them? Or do you want to have polygons that have variability in them? Because the various cover types to be classified are, in fact, spectrally variable, right? There's no spectra for forest per se. The spectral value for a forest, the average spectral value for a forest, is made up of the spectral values for the kinds of tree that's there, the kind of um, whether the, the trees are sunlit or shadowed, that's both at the landscape scale, but it's also, you know, within um, forests, you get shadowing of one tree by another. So you're going to have brightly lit foliage, darkly lit foliage. You can have soil. If there's soil exposed, you're going to have needles um, or um, dead leaves of various types, and you're going to have understory vegetation. There, each one of those has a, a spectral signature of its own. But the forest itself, you know, that's fundamentally just an average of the individual spectral signatures. Um, so you need to know uh, land cover class, um, and you then delineate polygon. You can delineate the polygons of the associated areas manually. And imagine it's called an AOI. Um, an area of interest. In Envy, it's called an ROI, a region of interest. And in ArcGIS, I think they just call them polygons. They don't give them a special name. Um, so you can delineate them manually that way. You can also use um, the seed procedure. Um, in Imagine, and I believe in ArcGIS, and basically what that allows you to do is click on an area and um, select a threshold that allows you to only get pixels that are similar enough to the place that you clicked that they fit within the threshold. That's often a very good way to do things because again, drawing polygons manually, it's very much possible to draw over areas that are not actually of the cover type that you're interested in. Um, using a GIS database is a tempting idea. You know, there are thousands, tens of thousands, I guess hundreds of thousands for, for some government collected field plot networks to use as a training data set. And if you have availability to them, which is a problem we'll talk about, um, that's, doesn't require, you know, you don't have to spend time or money or the boredom of actually collecting signatures uh, generally a bad idea so first of all often these plots 
only have point locations associated with them, not polygons. Um, so if you just want to generalize the point to a polygon, so for instance, if you have the agency's plot layout, you know, which might consist of, you know, several um, circular areas that um, that data will be collected in uh, for a particular uh, plot type. Um, uh, if you just generalize your point to that polygon in a simple way, you're often going to have features in there that are spectrally quite different, like road or water. So that's going to increase your class spectral variability. And so as a consequence, um, because the variability gets increased using classification techniques such as the uh, maximum likelihood approach, that class may wind up um, um, incorporating a lot of spectrally very different areas into the particular class. Agency classifications are not always compatible with remote sensing. Um, so generally they're uh, more complex than remotely sensed data can handle. So you might have a lot of different um, species um, classifications that you simply can't observe those differences with remote sensing. All of these agencies do their best, but the field classification accuracy and the data management are not always uh, optimal. optimal. Um, um, they're big, it's a big job. It's a big job. For instance, the forest inventory and analysis program at the, at the forest service, it's an enormous undertaking, um, to collect all that data. And so it's just, there are errors that you can avoid if you're, you're just doing a, a much smaller number of points. Um, and the point locations, um, are not always that accurate when they're accurate, that is the, the GPS points for the center of the, the plots. And they're not always available to the general public. So forest inventory and analysis plots, you have to be a FIA, forest inventory and analysis um, personnel in order to get direct access to those locations. Uh, some rules of thumb on adequate sampling. Um, the minimum number of pixels in each of your, your training data samples should be about 10 times the number of bands. And that's because as the number of bands increases, the amount of uncertainty in a single band has to decrease to lead to the same overall uncertainty. Um, you need at least three to 10 polygons for each spectral class, and three would be for something like water that's easy to distinguish if, in fact, in your data set, you don't have a lot of deep, dark, shadowed forest and, and water is easy to uh, distinguish. Um, yeah, you're gonna need at least three for that class, but you're probably gonna need 10 and possibly 20 or more polygons for each spectral class. And it's important to capture the variability of each cover type, so you can't, um, you can't simply sample um, very similar um, corn uh, polygons and hope to get all of the corn in uh, that's in your scene in that particular class. Some of that corn may be unusual looking corn, um, but there may be a lot of quote unquote, unusual looking corn that you have to capture. Um, you need to think about how many spectral classes you're gonna need for each information class. So for instance, if you do have, you know, if perhaps you had a, maybe you have irrigated corn and you have non-irrigated corn and the non-irrigated corn is gonna have less green area. Um, it may not be as vibrantly green. So you might be having to think about having a separate spectral subclass for non-irrigated corn and, and irrigated corn. Um, this is why you very often want to do a pre-classification analysis. And that pre-classification analysis would be an unsupervised classification 
probably with a, a reasonably large number of classes so that you can see um, you know you can ask yourself okay what what classes are naturally dropping out because if certain classes are naturally dropping out of an unsupervised classification analysis then it's likely you're going to have to take account of them when you're doing your supervised classification um, training statistics so as you're doing your training um, one thing you can look at is histograms for individual polygons okay um, or for um, all the polygons in a particular spectral class to make sure that it's got a reasonably um, smooth preferably Gaussian distribution okay so for instance if you did a histogram of all of the data values you know spectral values for a given band for uh, a particular polygon and you found that there were some outlier values like most of the values were between 100 well let's say uh, 0.3 reflectance and 0.35 reflectance and then there were a couple that were 0.7 you probably want to get rid of the pixels that are 0.7 because they just they're just too unlike the original ones to be used meaningfully in a, uh, a supervised classification context um, um, and then once you've gotten all of the training samples you've got together for a particular uh, class again doing a set of histograms is a good idea because again, you might have a particular polygon that is very much unlike the other polygons in that class. And there are, there are ways to get these histogram things done within the popular, um, popular software packages. Uh, a contingency matrix. You can actually do a classification for the training data. Um, and make sure that your classification algorithm is actually correctly classifying just your training data. Um, so if you find that, oh wait, lots of my oats are being classified as corn, um, if that's happening at the training level data, then um, that's a problem and it's just going to get you know it's just going to follow through so you're going to have to go back to your data and figure out what what spectral classes are causing the problem you might have to redefine what spectral classes um, you're going to produce note we use contingency matrices when we do accuracy assessment we'll talk about them in, in gripping detail however we don't use the training data okay when we do the accuracy assessment we use a separate set of testing data that we'll talk about so you shouldn't confuse using a contingency matrix with your training data with your actual accuracy assessment which needs to have a separate source of testing data um you have a question of lumpers and splitters um so how many spectral classes can you actually deal with? Should you lump spectrally similar classes uh, to, together and have fewer spectral subclasses? Or should you keep them separate, have them split? Some people tend to lump different conditions together. Some people tend to, to split them. Um, what is important to be aware of is for mixed edge spectral classes, and you'll want to get rid of these you know sometimes you have back to the example of a forest and a uh, with a, a road adjacent to it you know in something like landsat where you have large pixels you're going to have pixels that mix those two conditions and that's a problem because uh, you those pixels don't look like anything in the actual scene um they're only good there because they're the mix so you have to be um, um 
very careful about um, any edges in the, the data set that you use to make your spectral classes. Um, you also want to make sure that you don't want to merge too many spectral classes that are somewhat similar together, or you can wind up with a very broad spectral class and have your whole image classified as that particular class. A lot of that material I just gave you borders on the contradictory, and it seems that way because it's a question of finding the right balance between putting a lot of things, lumping, splitting, um, um, and it's just something that comes with experience. Um, some other limitations of classification, um, in this case, supervised classification, you know, you have to have good knowledge of the area and um, and the identification of cover types at known locations. Your knowledge of the scene and what's going on in it is more important than any algorithm or, um, and no algorithm is gonna save you from having to know the details of what's going on in a scene, or at least knowing someone who does. Um, other limitation of classification is you as the analyst may not know enough about the interactions between your information categories of interest and their spectral variability. And therefore you're not going to be able to obtain a, a good representative sample of all the important spectral classes present. And again, these are concerns that tend to go away with experience.